Bruchem Aboyim, thank you for coming. Um, tonight's lecture will be on what we call TMI, too much information. What does that mean? So the Torah commands us not to frequent fortune tellers and psychics. The first mention of this prohibition is found in the book of Leviticus, Vayikra, in the portion of Kedoshim, 1931, where it states, do not turn to mediums or oracles, do not seek them out, and so make yourself unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Prohibition is again stated in the portion of, same portion, in 26. It says, if a person turns to mediums and oracles so as to prostitute himself to their ways, I will direct my anger against him and cut him off from his people. Again, the greatest form of punishment called chorus, excision. It's mentioned again in the book of Devarim. In the portion of Shoftim, verses 10 through 14, there it says, Among you there shall not be found anyone who passes his son or daughter through fire, who practices stick divination, who divines auspicious times, who divines by omens, who practices witchcraft, who uses incantations, who consults mediums and oracles, or who attempts to communicate with the dead. Anyone involved in these practices is repulsive to God. So with these three places, these three references, we see very clearly that God does not want us to even try to forecast our futures. We believe that our fate is in the hands of heaven. And sometimes having more information about the future can be detrimental. We see two examples mentioned in the Torah and another in Tanakh. The first example in the Torah is with Rivka, our mother, in the book of Bereshit, and the portion of Toldot. The portion begins with her being sterile, and then God blesses her with the pregnancy. But it happens that her pregnancy is unusually difficult. So she goes to the prophet to seek a message from God. And God's, to her, God's words to her were, in verse, chapter 25, verse 23, the prophet told her that two nations are in your womb, Two governments will separate from inside of you. The upper hand will go from one government to the other. The older one will serve the younger one. In Rashi, we learn that even in the womb, one child was pulling towards houses of idol worship, and the other to houses of God. So from the time they were born, these twins, Rivka knew that Yaakov was the righteous son, and Asa was the evil one. She never told Yitzhak about the message she had received from God during the pregnancy. The Torah states that she loved Yaakov and Yitzhak loved Asa. <clears throat> so when the time came for Yitzhak to bless his firstborn son, he told Asa to bring him meat from the hunt so that he could bless him. Rivka overheard what Yaakov said and told her son, pardon me, what Yitzhak said, and told her son Yaakov that it was imperative that he disguised himself like his brother Asa and received the blessing. Yaakov was not comfortable with the whole deception, but his mother insisted and this was that this was the proper path for him to take. Yaakov followed his mother's command and took the blessing that was intended for his older brother. Yitzchak was well aware that his son Asa was not a learner, but he felt that he was more than capable of attaining wealth, especially with his blessing. It was his hope that the two brothers would form what we call the Yisachar Zavulim relationship, where Asa would use his wealth to support his brother Yaakov in his religious pursuits. Rivka felt that Yaakov was blind, not just physically, but also to whom his son Asa really was. She thought that if the blessing were to be given to Asa, he would not share his wealth with his younger brother and that Yaakov would suffer greatly. She felt it was imperative that he be able to support himself. And so, she insisted that Yaakov taste the blessing, even if it meant being disingenuous. The Archaim HaKadosh states that she erred by having Yaakov take the blessing from Esau. God gives us windows of opportunity in life to turn ourselves around, to repent, to do tshuva, because, and become who we were meant to be. 
This was one of Asaph's opportunities, and she blocked it. Not only that, she created a hatred and anger between the two brothers that would last forever. There seems to be a proof to what the Orachayim said that he was correct in his assessment of the story. After Yaakov took the blessing from Esau, he was forced to leave home, to run from home. She told him that through a prophetic vision, she was able to see that Esau was planning to kill Yaakov. And so she told him to flee to her brother's home in Chara. That was the last time she saw her beloved son. She never saw him again. She wasn't able to attend his weddings, nor to participate at the birth and circumcision of her grandchildren. Even when she died, he was not there to bury her. Her husband Yitzhak was blind, so he, she, was, she was estranged from her son Esau, and so she was buried by the local Chitim, strangers. A steep price to pay because of TMI, too much information. If the Navi had not told her about her twins, and if she had not heard about Yitzhak's desire to bless his eldest son, the end of her life may well have been much happier and much fuller. We also find in the book of Bamidbar, in the portion of Korach, that Korach was only one of four men who had the honor and privilege to carry the Holy Ark in the desert. He was also the richest man in the desert, since the Medrash says that he found the treasure that Yosef had hidden in the desert from the wealth that he'd acquired during the years of famine in the world, again, when Egypt had food. Korach felt slighted. He wanted to be the Kohen Gadol. He wanted to be the high priest. He felt that Moshe had shown nepotism by appointing his brother Aaron to that position. Now, <clears throat> there really was a logic to Korach's claim. He felt that although Aaron was a righteous and good person, he had made the golden calf. And based on the fact that, on that fact, why would God want Aaron to be given such a special and holy position? But he miscalculated. He didn't understand that the fact that Aaron had sinned and was totally broken by that sin made him even greater and more suitable for the position. As the rabbis tell us, that about tshuva, one who repents is greater than a tzaddik, than a righteous individual. But still, Moshe warned Korach that only one person would survive the test and the others would die. Those who were part of Korach's rebellion felt that they had really little to lose since it had already been decreed about them that those between the ages of 20 and 60 would die in the desert. And they were included in that decree. But Korach was a Levi, a Levite and was therefore not subject to that decree, to that punishment. So what made him think that he would survive? TMI, too much information. Korach was a prophet. He knew through divine revelation, prophecy, that there would be many righteous prophets that would descend from him. One of them would be Shmuel Hanavi, Samuel the prophet, of whom King David wrote in Psalm 99, that Shmuel was as great as Moshe and Aaron together. And so Korach surmised two things. Number one, that he would be the one to survive since all of his children were with him in his rebellion against Moshe. And the fact that he would have descendants meant that he would have to live. Secondly, we know that when Avram Abinu, when Abraham was thrown into the fiery furnace by Nimrod, the Zohar tells us that he was saved, not in his merit, but in the merit of his son and grandson, Yitzchak and Yaakov, even though they had not yet been born. So we see that having righteous descendants can save someone even before they entered this world. So Karak felt confident that the merit of Shmuel, Samuel the prophet, would protect him and that he would be the one that would survive. His logic was correct. Except for one thing. There is a Gemara that states that the day of Yom Kippur by itself is a source of atonement for those sins that one transgresses that are between man and God. However, let's say one eats pork on Yom Kippur based on this concept. Then Yom Kippur cannot be a source of atonement. 
since it was Yom Kippur itself which was the cause of his transgression. If he didn't know that he would be forgiven, he never would have eaten it. So Korach's rebellion was predicated on his prophetic revelation about Shmuel, Samuel, whose merit he felt would protect him. Since his knowledge about Shmuel caused him to sin, it could not at the same time protect him from that transgression. So he did not survive. The earth swallowed him up and, and his followers alive. TMI. That being the case, how did he have descendants? At that last moment, before the, as the earth was swallowing them up, his sons, sons repented. They did tshuva. And since they did, they did not rely on the merits of Shmuel, the prophet, his merit could and did help to protect them. And they did survive. There's another example of TMI found in the book of Shmuel, Samuel 1. The nation had requested a king. And God told Shmuel to anoint Shaul as the first king of Israel. He was a very righteous and humble person and deserving of the position. He was commanded by God to wipe out the nation of Amalek. Men, women, and children, even their animals, were to be put to death. Nothing, nothing of Amalek was to remain. Shaul sinned grievously. He killed out all the people, but he allowed Agog, the king of the Amaleki, to survive. Now he incarcerated him and waited for Shmuel for further instructions. And that night, Agog had relations with a slave woman, and she conceived. When Shmuel came to the camp of the Israelites and saw Agog was still alive, he informed Shaul that because he did not follow the command of God, his kingship would be taken from him and given to someone more worthy. Now, Shaul was a great tzaddik. He had killed all, out all the people, men, women, and children. So why would he allow a gug to live? Some commentaries say that since a gug was a king, so Shaul was extending special treatment to him, kind of a courtesy from one king to another. That makes no sense. Shaul was a great tzaddik. There has to be a more logical answer. And I believe the answer can be found again with the idea of TMI, too much information. Haman, as we know, as we all know, was a descendant of Agog. Haman Agogi is called. There's a medrash that states the descendants of Haman converted to Judaism. And they were Malamdi Tinokas B'nai Barak. And they were school teachers to young children in B'nai Barak. So we see in the story of Moshe in Shemos 2.12 that he killed an Egyptian because he was beating a Jewish slave. The verse states, the Yafan Kov Vuko, and he, Moshe looked all around before he killed the Egyptian. And the commentaries tell us that these words mean that Moshe looked into his past, the Egyptian, and also into his future to see if that Egyptian had done anything positive in the past or if he would have any descendants that would be worthy. When he saw that there were no merits to be found, Moshe killed him. This seems to indicate that if the Egyptian would have, that Moshe would have found any redeeming factors in this man's past or righteous descendants in the future, he would have spared him. So Shaul was confused as to what to do. On the one hand, he had been commanded to kill out all of Amalek. But by being a prophet, he saw that righteous descendants would descend from Agog. So because of TMI, he allowed Agog to live out the night. Had he not had that prophetic vision, he would have killed Agog immediately. Instead, he allowed him to live, which cost him his kingship and eventually his life, which allowed Haman to be born, which was almost the annihilation of the whole Jewish nation, TMI. So though we think that being able to forecast the future would be beneficial to our lives and happiness. From the Torah we see TMI can cause a person to err grievously. It is our mission in life to place one foot in front of the other and place our faith in God and that he will take care of our future. And with that, may we hasten the coming of Mashiach Sikenu quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for coming. God bless and Shabbat Shalom.